My name's Paul Dummett, um, and I'm one of the authors on the Life series. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the use of images in these course books. So I'm going to begin by asking you to look at an image, and I'm going to read you an accompanying text. OK, so here we go. Although there are few true Kazakh nomads left, most have given up their traditional nomadic lifestyle in favour of a more settled existence. One of their most famous traditions still endures, that of eagle hunting. Eagle hunting is an art that dates back to the days of Yengis Khan. Wrapped in warm clothes and fur hats to fend off the cold, eagle hunters can still be seen riding their small ponies across the plains of western Mongolia tracking foxes and other small mammals. An eagle hunter spends ten years with each bird, training it with great skill and patience, forming an intimate working relationship, even sharing with it the meat of the animals it kills. Now, if you had just heard that text, or perhaps read it somewhere, I imagine that unless you had some association with Kazakhstan or, or Western Mongolia, in a year's time you'd remember very little of that story. But if I showed you the picture in a year's time, the chances are that you would not only remember where you saw it, you'd remember what it was. You'd say to yourself, ah yes, that's a eagle hunter. They track the plains of Western Mongolia. I don't think there are very many of them left, in fact. They form this very close relationship with this bird. They sometimes even share the meat um, of the animals that the eagle kills with them. Now, why is that? Why is it that the picture is so memorable, that the image is so memorable? It's because images are the way that we store experiences. Our minds and memories work in images. When we came to write these books, uh, Life, using National Geographic content, the editorial team and the authors decided that the image was an extremely important part. With each um, unit that we wrote, each spread that we wrote in the books, um, we started with the image. Now that's a very unusual thing in a writing process. Normally you'd start with a particular topic or theme. You might start with a particular language point, a grammar point or a functional point. So let's say for example um, you were trying to communicate the idea of friendship or companionship. In a typical course book they would put in the text uh, and then they would bring in stock, what we call stock images of friends and people in a friendly relationship. You, I think you know the kind of thing, a group of friends with um, bright white smiles, rather like something from a dental advertisement perhaps. But how much more compelling is this? Or perhaps this? Now the point about images like this is that they demand an emotional response. They engage your interest. They draw you in if you like. And in fact, that's what National Geographic magazine does so well. So what we're trying to do with photographs in this course is several things. It's first of all to get an emotional response, then to engage the learner's interest, to stimulate discussion, um, generally to support discourse, be it written discourse or spoken discourse. And the final thing, and perhaps the most important thing, is to make learning last. I'd just like you to look at this picture. This is from the upper intermediate level. All the units in the books begin with a striking photograph, and this is no exception. You're drawn in, and you say to yourself, what are these people doing here? Are they refugees of some kind? What's going on? Then you listen to the story. The picture supports the discourse. These are, in fact, the parents of first-year university students in Guangzhou in China. And because very often they have only children, they've invested a great deal in their children's future. And so when they first go to university, they follow them there. And they spend perhaps two, three, sometimes four weeks 
with their children. And because they're generally not from very well-off families, they can't afford to stay in the local hotel. So the university has put them up in the university gym. When I say put them up, you can see what they've done. They've allowed them to sleep on the floor on mats like this. So that then stimulates discussion. It stimulates an interesting cultural discussion. Is that particular investment or strong investment in your children's future a typically Chinese thing or does it exist in other cultures? If there's just one thing I'd like you to take from this, it's that an image can be a fantastic starting point for any lesson. All students now have um, with them um, either cameras or smartphones on which they can take photos and this is a great resource for you as a teacher to use. This is an activity based on um, a text in um, the advanced level of life which is about a Japanese poet called Basho. Late in life he set off on a journey across Japan um, writing little poems, haikus, about what he called nature's modest dramas. And here's an example, a leaf floating in a mountain stream. So what I asked students to do was to use this, this sort of idea, nature's modest dramas, as an inspiration to go out and to photograph things that they saw, um, little events that caught their eye, and to bring them back to the classroom, and then to describe the picture they'd taken, why they'd taken it. There are many other exercises you can do like this, getting students to photograph perhaps their favourite graffiti, um, their favourite building, other things like that. Um, it's generative for vocabulary, it's generative for discussion, and it goes quite deep because, as I said right at the beginning, and I can't say often enough, it involves emotional engagement, and emotional engagement is extremely key to learning.